There is little doubt that Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is one of the most content-rich RPGs that we've seen out of the series, and many fans and commentaries have been quick to revere the immersive, amplified world on offer here. However, while the array of gameplay has rightly been celebrated, there has, much like with its predecessor, been slightly more debate around the structure and direction of its story, and indeed, most specifically, about the approach to certain characters that have appeared in this reimagined world. So here, I'm going to break down a, a few characters that were reintroduced in a slightly different fashion for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and a fair warning here that this episode will feature some spoilers for characters and events that occur much later on in the game. Now, first up, we have Red Thirteen, and for the most part, I love Red Thirteen's inclusion. Uh, I really liked the way he was teased at the end of uh, FF7 Remake, and then introduced fully in Rebirth, and I think he was great for maybe the first half of the game, because beginning Rebirth, he is very much the Red Thirteen that we'd, we've come to expect, uh, right up until we get to Cosmo Canyon, when it's revealed that he's both comparatively mature in human years, being in his 40s, but actually basically a teenager in in terms of his own species years. And while yes, this is holding true with the original characterization of Red Thirteen uh, in the original game, in Rebirth what they did is they emphasized this by completely changing Red Thirteen's voice and personality from this wizened elder to a high-pitched sort of immature teenager, which seems to have really divided players. Now, some have been quick to point out that, like many Final Fantasy games, if we actually look to the original Japanese version, there is a lot of nuance in the dialogue that further characterises certain characters in certain ways. So Cyan, Final Fantasy VI, is the first example I, I saw of this. Uh, but actually, very much with Red Thirteen, in the Japanese version, they do change his dialogue to make it more informal speech patterns, rather than his more complex, sort of formal one, after it's revealed how young he is. And while yes, okay, it is authentic to the original game, that doesn't necessarily make it good and translate well to uh, like the voice-acted versions of the games. And as I say, the step change has certainly riled some fans who preferred the more grizzled version of Red Thirteen. And for my part, I think I always felt the whole appeal of Red Thirteen in both the original and in Rebirth is his affinity to nature and the mysteries of the planet. He maintained and carried through this angle and this perspective uh, in the party from both Aerith, because obviously she eventually leaves the party, and also Bugenhagen's perspectives, and he carries through this sort of Cosmo Canyon ethos and this affinity to the planet through the entire game. So he kept that core theme relevant uh, to the central party. And so having his maturity as something of a masquerade and actually a defence mechanism is how he sort of posits it in the game. Uh, it actually, I think, impacts that. Uh, it also, I think, impacts the comedy potential of Red Thirteen because a lot of his humour is derived from the fact he takes himself and everything so seriously. Uh, he's a very deadpan character. I think one of my favourite examples of this in Rebirth is after we fight the Golem boss in the Mishville Mines and it's, it's Barrett and Red Thirteen we rejoin the party and Barrett makes a sort of terrible joke about fighting the golem with Red Thirteen and Red Thirteen just looks, just completely ignores what he says and starts talking about something else with the party, which is really funny. So I kind of agree with those that felt his character was negatively impacted by this sort of infantile turn and this potent serious stuff about the planet. Uh, it was handled much more by Aerith throughout the, the duration of Rebirth, um, more so than anyone else. So I was mildly supply, surprised where they went with this. I was actually surprised at how they characterised Bugenhagen as well. I always had him down as a more philosophical Alan Watts character rather than a deranged Elrond Hubbard sort of character, but that's a character uh, to discuss another day. Now, moving on to Dine next. Uh, Dine is actually one of my favourite characters in Final Fantasy VII. Uh, he marks an incredible turning point and a very dark and dramatic moment in the original game during the subplot where we're exploring Barrett's backstory. And ever since the announcement of the remake series, he is one of the characters that I've wondered how they would handle in this new and reimagined world. And I think a large part of that is because I, I wondered whether they were going to feature the climactic suicide of Dine um, at the end of the battle with Barrett. 
because even to this day, let alone back in 1997, it's very uncommon to see something as dramatic as a suicide in video games, uh, particularly one as dramatic as Dine's, but it is nonetheless what makes the tragedy of his character and by extension Barrett's backstory so memorable. So I did have my doubts that they would showcase a suicide in 4K in a Final Fantasy game, and what they opted to do instead was sort of a last stand slash suicide by cop thing where Dine faces down a bunch of Shinra infantry and then kind of gets shot up, which was a bit hammy. Uh, and this entire segment with Dine, it, drid, it did draw criticisms uh, from a few players. But for me, I think they pulled it back with Dine's dying words, uh, which I really liked because Dine being killed by Shinra, what that would have done if, if it had just been Dine being killed by Shinra, it removes the guilt from Barrett somewhat because he's been killed by Shinra. So by having Dine have this dying monologue uh, on Barrett and the fact that he there's no redemption, he doesn't forgive Barrett and actually quite the adverse of that, he, he tells Barrett that he can live with this guilt. Um, he's sort of unloading his guilt onto Barrett. That was really brutal. Uh, I actually really quite liked that line. So I think it was similar in spirit to the original game, if not directly following in its footsteps with, with that scenario. But as I say, I do understand why some fans uh, didn't necessarily like it. Next up, we have Vincent Valentine. Now, I've always liked Vincent. Uh, I think it was obvious from the outset that both he and Yuffie were going to be integrated into the core story because it would be an unwieldy systemic mess to try and have them as optional or secret characters with all of the narrative and mechanical implications there. But where Yuffie's introduction changed, uh, and I think Sedgwayed quite seamlessly into the story, and actually where I didn't care much for Yuffie in the original game, and I'll talk about this more at length another time, uh, I find it really interesting that she's actually probably one of my favourite characters in, in Rebirth. But where she was integrated in that way, and I think quite seamlessly into the main story of Rebirth, Vincent arguably was handled in a slightly more janky way, not for how he looks or how he acts or how he appears, which was all kind of pure Vincent and it was quite faithful, but more so it was this characterization and story element that was introduced where he's sort of still in the employ of Shinra and he's sort of a, a gatekeeper for Shinra in, in the game. Uh, around the Shinra mansion. So completely new angle here for Vincent Valentine, where he's basically threatening the party not to explore the mansion basement on behalf of Shinra, which makes very little sense since Vincent is a former Turk and he originally locked himself away to atone for his guilt about Lucrezia. So he has as much reason as anyone to hate the Shinra and that's actually what joins him up with the party in the original game. Well, actually it's more the Vendetta with Sephiroth, but still, there's no love lost with, with Shinra um, and Vincent. So this whole scenario was basically introduced to facilitate a boss fight with Demon Vincent. And I'm not kidding, as soon as I visited the Shinra mansion, right at the beginning of the game in the Nibelheim flashback, and I saw that big open space in the basement, I instantly thought, this looks like a boss fight location. And lo and behold, right towards the end of the game, it was. So I feel like they could have dropped the whole Vincent being a company man thing and it wouldn't have dented, it wouldn't have changed anything else about his inclusion in that game apart from the reason to have that boss fight. So it was a bit of a weird one. Um, overall, you know, as I say, I like Vincent. I'm glad he's back. It was just one of the many instances in this game where Square seemed to want to create a boss fight for no particular reason. Now, coming on to the final character that I wanted to discuss, we have Sid Highwind. Now, Sid and Vincent both echo Red 13's role uh, as he appeared in the first remake game, which is we are arriving at the tail end of, of the main game story, and so they weren't integrated fully into the party, they weren't playable characters or anything like that. And I actually like that. I, I think it's a good teaser for the third instalment, and it allows them to be introduced softly before integrating them you know in the next game rather than jumping into straight into gameplay at the end of the game where we have limited use with them but looking but looking specifically to Sid I think of all of the party members that we've been reintroduced to Sid Highwind is probably the most different uh, in terms of how he's introduced and characterized and I suppose much like Dine there are controversial elements to Sid's appearance in the original game, uh, namely his treatment of 
poor sharer in the in the original in Rocket Town. And beyond that, most importantly, because of the sheer scale and size of Rebirth, there was no real scope to introduce Rocket Town uh, in this game, uh, which is where we originally meet him. So I suppose the question for the Square team would have been introduce Sid now and have all the characters primed for that final instalment, or introduce him in the final game in a canonical or more canonical retelling of Rocket Town, which would have deprived us of the tiny Bronco and the free roam aspects in the final act of, of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. So quite a pickle here. I can see how they were trying to sort of juggle the, the story with the mechanics and, and these gameplay elements. Uh, and I'm not averse to Sid Highwind having appeared as a pilot uh, that taxis us around, by the way. Uh, I think that was fine. However, I think it's everything in between and the nuance of, of Sid's character in Rebirth, his raison d'etre, or lack thereof, that kind of dents his character a little bit, uh, which I'll get into. Uh, but firstly, in terms of the whole parallel universe thing that Rebirth has opted for, I'm actually not sure where that whole Sephiroth changing things begins and where Square have just wholesale changed things for, for effect ends. So for example, uh, is Sid Highwind now a taxi pilot because of some butterfly effect in Sephiroth's fate departed world? Or is it just Square saying we need to introduce this guy and make the Bronco playable somehow so let's completely rewrite the original? Much like how they did with Yuffie and Priscilla, even the location of the Temple of the Ancients, all of this stuff, I'm not sure um, if that's clarified. But regardless, the way they opted to introduce Sid, or rather integrate Sid to the party's cause, was rather than the original, where he's this expert engineer of the Highwind airship and this aspiring astronaut who has had his dreams dashed by Shinra, they made him a character who apparently had a thing for Aerith's, Aerith's mum, and so chooses to help the party based purely on that, which, for a few reasons, jars with the original depiction of Sid, who firstly, much like the rest of the party, was originally drawn into events because he's a victim of Shinra, so he's very symbolically linked to the rest of the characters in the party because of this sort of detrimental sort of effect that Shinra have had of him. You know, he's a victim, he's suffered at their hands. But Rebirth also makes him much more affable and friendly, um, indeed slightly more comical and, in, and goofy in how he haphazardly handles the tiny Bronco. And so he's very much the opposite of this gruff specialist professional that we had in the original game. And indeed, where he's previously been posited as something of an engineering genius, in Rebirth, I think he considers himself more of a a wasted talent grease monkey in the grand scheme of, of Shinra's engineering department. So actually, it was quite a big U-turn with Sid's characterization here, because naturally, in the original, he is a clear leader. Uh, we see him as a second-in-command, he's the Highwind's captain, and indeed, he's a playable stand-in for Cloud after the Medeal incident. Big U-turn here, where he's now been repositioned as something more of a comic relief and secondary sort of facilitator of transport, really, in the grand scheme of things. And I suppose if it was me d down to me writing the game, I, I would have kept Sid's appearance in Rebirth. I think that makes sense. Um, and for the mechanics, it is a necessity to have that free, free roaming at the end of the game. But I would have kept him more as a cameo and a soft introduction that we don't really learn about until the third instalment, where we would visit Rocket Town and have something a bit closer to the original which is basically what they've done with Red 13 in this game. So quite a weird introduction to Sid here. Um, of all of these characters discussed, I sort of, I didn't, in the scheme of things, I didn't mind it. It didn't kind of d deter me from the game at all. Um, although I know it's controversial for a lot of people, with the exception of Sid, because Sid was actually my, my favourite character in Final Fantasy VII, the original game. And this repositioning of him, uh, it has changed my perception of him, and as I say, I sort of weirdly have been leaning towards Yuffie and Barrett as my favourite characters now in the remake saga, while the original game it's still probably Sid. So interesting how our perceptions change of characters depending on how they're written. So there's some top-level thoughts on the more criticised characters of this game. Uh, some players have re reacted well to them, some don't like them. Uh, but each have certainly proved uh, a radical departure from how they were positioned in the original game. 